So this is Gorilla Physics and I'm going to talk you through interference patterns. I'm going to tell you everything that you need to know to master interference at A level. Make sure you subscribe because other channels well they teach you the content but I'm going to teach you how to get that A star. Interference is an application of the difference between path difference and phase difference. At maximums we have multiples of wavelength path difference and that corresponds to zero phase difference. Where we have minima we have odd multiples of half wavelength path difference and that corresponds to 180 degrees or pi phase difference or anti-phase. What this chap is doing here is he's moving his detector through a field where he's created an overlapping set of two sources of EM radiation and his detector shows points of maxima and minima. They are points of constructive interference and destructive interference. Constructive interference happens when two waves are in phase at point and destructive interference happens when two waves are pi out of phase or we could say in anti-phase. Essentially constructive interference is where peak and peak line up and destructive interference is where peak and trough line up. Constructive interference where they are in phase, destructive interference where they are pi out of phase. If you haven't checked out the path versus phase difference video I suggest you go back and check that one out before looking at this video. The simplest way to think about superposition, which is what is going on here, is to think about a pulse and an echo, or a pulse and a reflection. Notice that the pulse on this slinky, as it reflects back, is inverted. As any wave reflects from a surface, you get this inversion. So a peak becomes a trough. If you can imagine at the same point on that slinky, the peak and the trough meeting, well they would cancel out to be no displacement at all. Notice wave displacement wave. is a vector like any other vector and that can be summed. The rule you need to remember of whether two waves can interfere is that they need to be coherent. They need to be coherent and that just means they have a constant phase relationship, so an unchanging phase difference. So they're always pi out phase or they're always in phase. And that means they need to be the same frequency. Now we also say they have to be the same amplitude and the reason for that is because if it was a very different amplitude you wouldn't really notice the interference between the two waves. We're going to have two circular patterns overlapping that there are points where there's actually no wave at all. See those lines where there's no disturbance on the water and that is because two waves there are meeting at antiphase and in between those you can see the areas of maximum energy transfer. Troughs are always meeting troughs and peaks are always meet, meeting peaks and that means they constructively superpose on one another. Interference patterns can happen for lots of reasons. For example if you have two circular sources like I do here on this ripple tank. It is how come that light and light can meet and produce darkness or a wave and a wave can meet and produce still water or no displacement. Water waves diffracting into bays also have this effect. You can get it reflecting from walls, and importantly, if parallel waves then diffract through two gaps, you get semicircular patterns which overlap and cause diffraction patterns as well. That's the case for laser light when we look at the diffraction grating and Young's double slit experiment in the next video. I strongly suggest that you fiddle with these FET sims. I definitely suggest that you complete the exercise that I do in this video. I definitely recommend having a good play about with this FET sim. It takes you right the way through from just understanding how pulses move across water and takes you all the way through to understanding how waves can overlap in interference patterns. So here we have two semicircular wave patterns coming from, well, these are just waves on water. The same can be said of sound and you get these points of destructive interference and constructive interference where you get no sound at all and where you get maximum energy transfer and you can also measure make measurements of these different points by using all these different measuring tools that they have on the simulation you can change frequency and observe how that changes the distribution of those maxima and minima you can really use these simulations to get your head around this idea of interference including interference with light which is what we're going to go on to with laser light and diffraction gratings in what is a really important core practical required practical or PAG in A-level physics. Some other examples are what water coming towards slits in boundaries, what happens to those? The same can be said of sound, they are diffracted into semicircular wave patterns. And you can even change here, you can change the slit width to see how that affects the amount of diffraction that occurs. And you can work with light, you can change the wavelength of light, you can change the slit separation, and you can even do the two slit 
interference patterns, the classic young experiment that will be part of your A-level. You can even go as far as look at diffraction in two dimensions, diffraction around a circular object, a square object, or even crystallography, which is diffraction and interference through crystalline structures. You can change how that would look with different wavelengths, and you can change how that would look with different patterns of crystals. This is how we know the crystal makeup of different materials. Fantastic simulation. I always recommend FET sims. Thank you so much for these simulations. Remember that at points in space where we have multiples of lambda path difference, that's multiples of the wavelength path difference, we have waves that are in phase. And at odd multiples of half wavelengths, we have waves that are meeting a point out of phase. And so we have destructive interference. That causes the maxima where you have waves in phase and the minima where you have waves that are pi out of phase or in antiphase or 180 degrees out of phase. Interference with sound is something that you can try at home. Behind my PC you can just see in this shot a stereo pair of speakers and that's all you really need to do this is a stereo pair of speakers. Your TV will have a stereo pair of speakers, your computer will have a stereo pair of speakers, probably the ones on your laptop might be a bit too close but any large monitors normally got a pair of stereo speakers built in. And all I'm going to do is I'm going to run the tone generator on this app here. This is just online tone generator dot com. <laughs> It's playing one constant tone, and hopefully as I move the microphone through the space in front of you, you should be able to hear points where it's a maximum and points where it's a minimum. I've got the tone generator set on 880 hertz here and notice there's a maximum right in the middle, in the center between those two sources. All you need is a constant tone because it needs to be coherent. If you didn't hear it through the space in the middle of a room, then try near a wall. When sound reflects off a wall, you get interference between the incident sound wave and the reflected sound wave. That's normally where you can hear that effect the best. Completing this exercise will give you a really good understanding of interference and how those interference patterns are set up. So this is one you should definitely do to understand interference. What you're gonna need is a bit of square paper or graph paper and uh, a pair of compasses. If you don't have square paper and graph paper, then I printed some out from Massphere, thanks very much. Or you can just do this on plain paper, just be really careful about your lengths. I'm gonna use the graph paper to actually help me get my wavelengths right. And you probably need a ruler as well. I'm gonna talk about waves coming from these two sources. They're six centimeters apart, and the wavelength of my waves are gonna be two centimeters. So I'm just going to model that I have wavelengths starting from each of these sources using my compasses and traveling out radially as all waves do. The solid lines are gonna be my wave fronts, and I'm gonna do a dotted line in between each wave front to be the pi outer face. Or if you like, you can just think about the dark lines as being the peaks and the dotted lines as being the troughs. If you kind of had the situation where the wave was paused in space. You just need to do as many such that you've got a large enough area where you've got the overlapping wave fronts here. Now we're gonna look for the points of constructive interference and we're gonna look for the points of destructive interference. So I'm gonna do a little cross every time a wave front crosses. Every time the two dark lines crosses, I'm gonna mark that with a cross. That is where we have waves that are in phase. So we have constructive interference. So I'm just going through my whole diagram and finding all those points where we have the solid line, the peaks, if you like, matching up at the same point in space with peaks. I can do it behind the diagram as well a little bit. 
Okay, so that's all of those. Now I'm going to line those up, I'm going to join those up with a solid line to indicate all of the points where I have constructive interference. And this is a little bit like drawing a line of best fit on a graph. Now let's just pause for a moment and talk about what's happening at those crosses and, and indeed anywhere along that line. Let's talk about this one here. We have a wave that's traveled two wavelengths of path together. And from the other source, we have another wave that's traveled two full wavelengths of path together. So those two waves arrive in phase. So because they're in phase, there is constructive interference and we get a maxima. We get a point of maximum displacement. The same is true anywhere along this line, except at this point, it's three full wavelengths to get there, four full wavelengths and so on. The point is that anywhere along this line, both waves have traveled the same distance and so arrive in phase. The path difference is zero. And we call that the zeroth order maximum. Now in this case, let's look at this point here. The wave from this, the left-hand side source, has traveled one, two, three wavelengths to get there. And the wave from this, the right-hand side source, has just traveled two full wavelengths. So there is a path difference. There's a path difference of lambda. There's a path difference of one wavelength. Because there's a one full wavelength path difference, they've arrived there in phase. So there's constructive interference. Here there, again, there's a path difference of one wavelength. This time from the left, it's traveled four wavelengths. And this time from the right, a path of three wavelengths. So the path difference is one wavelength, as so it is everywhere along this line here. We say there's constructive interference whenever there are multiples of full wavelengths path difference. Now, how about in between those lines? Well, here you can see that I have a peak lining up with a trough. And same here and same here. I have the darker line indicating my peak and I have the dotted line indicating my trough from the other side. So let's go on now and find all of the points at which you have peak lining up with trough. In other words, all of the points where you have 90 degrees or whether you have pi phase difference. Okay, that's plenty for my purposes now. So let's talk about any one of those. Let's talk about this one here. The wave from the left has traveled three wavelengths. The wave from the right has traveled three and a half wavelengths. They have a path difference of half a wavelength. So they've arrived pi hour phase. So at all of these points, and I'm gonna join them with a dotted line to indicate a minimum, a node if you like, of zero energy transfer. So anywhere on those dotted lines, we have odd multiples of half wavelength path difference. So we have 90 degrees of phase difference. So there is destructive interference there. Hopefully now it makes sense what you saw when I moved my microphone across my room where I had one note playing because we, we heard loud, quiet, loud, quiet, loud, quiet, loud, quiet just like the gentleman pushing his microwave detector across his field. Maxima. George W. Walger, take a bow. A nice thing to do to finish this exercise off is to imagine what it would be like if you were indeed moving across any line like this. And it could be that we're dealing with sound, or it could be that we're dealing with microwaves, or it could be that we're dealing with light, as we will be later on when we talk about the laser interference practical. But let's just produce this wave up onto a screen. So imagine that this is laser light now, and that we are looking at the screen from this end on. So what would we see produced on this screen? So we'd see on this, where this solid line is, we'd see a maximum displacement. Where this dotted line is, and I'm gonna use the graph paper to line it up, we would see zero, we would see nothing at all. Where this solid line is, where the solid line hits the screen, we would see a maximum again, or a maximum displacement, we could say, and I'll vary this, I'll do this as a standing wave in a second. And then a dotted, where the dotted line crosses, project it up to my screen, we'd see a zero again. And then where the solid line crosses, we would see a maximum. Same for this side here, zero there. And then I can join that up into a kind of waveform shape. So we have this wave-like shape, but its wavelength is changing. And because we're not really just talking about a fixed wave at any point, we're talking about a standing wave being produced. 
Then we have on that line, we have points of maximum displacement, we call these antinodes, and we have points of zero displacement, and we call these nodes. When we're dealing with light, we call them bright fringes and just darkness. That's all there is to it really, that is the interference patterns between two circular sources and it works exactly the same if it's laser light approaching two gaps and being diffracted and those two semicircular patterns are overlapping or if it's waves on water or if it's sound in the room. If you've done that and you still aren't following that then I suggest you really think hard about this idea of path difference and phase difference being very much related and make sure you're clear on that idea of superposition and when we have waves that are in phase we get constructive interference and when we have waves that are pi out of phase we get destructive interference. So if you want to do an exercise to consolidate this I suggest you change the separation of the two sources or you change the wavelength of your source and you repeat the exercise again. Constructive interference where they're in phase and destructive interference where they are out of phase, exactly pi out of phase. A single disturbance like this is called a pulse. So this is a pulse wave. Here it is in slow motion. Notice the reflected wave. Here's George again, modeling crystallography. Each peg represents a row of ions in the crystal. Water waves will be generated moving towards the model. Then we get a strong reflected wave or constructive interference. If you got that, if that was useful, just comment boom in the comments below. And don't forget to check out guerrillaphysics.com for all my videos organized by topic.